would like to start us off today? I can go any time, but Travis wasn't with us last week, so if he wants to start. Travis. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off for now. I'm the only one in the reading room at the moment, okay. and I'm still getting stuff put together. Okay. Howard, can you go first then? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay, I'm going to start off by showing a couple of highlighted excerpts of an article that I came across that's really interesting. So this is written by a pathologist, the first author, whom I certainly have heard of before about the pathology of chronic hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. But I'll just go through a couple places where, for example, here he describes the difficulty in distinguishing UIP, IPF from chronic a hypersensitivity pneumonitis and how there's variations among pathologists. He asserts that UIP has probably been overdiagnosed by pathologists in many cases are actually chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. He sort of intimates that in terms of imaging that there's certainly an overlap in the imaging features which I agree with so that it's often very hard, impossible to make the distinction, I think. Just going on here, he describes certain pathological findings like fibroblast foci, for example, and even some honeycombing may also be seen in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis compared to UIP. Um, there's one form of Chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis with UIP-like features that is difficult and contentious, as you see in that statement there. And he pretty much concludes with something which is really interesting. He says, at least in their institution, that typically they don't sign out cases of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis without maybe consulting and having a face-to-face -face discussion with clinicians and radiologist, which is interesting. So with that, I just happen to have two cases with interesting imaging features, but I do have an open lung biopsy on two and not on one of them. So let's start with this one. And I can bring alongside the coronals. So scrolling through this one, we certainly see findings of an interstitial fibrosing lung disorder. Up here, there's parenchymal reticulation. Up high, we see foci like this, which I interpret as likely areas of traction bronchiectasis. As we go lower down, we actually see diminished lung disease, and certainly right down here in the lung bases, we don't see any of the typical findings that we look for of UIP, particularly basal predominant reticulation, traction bronchiolectasis, or honeycombing. And we see the same imaging features and the distribution of disease on the coronal series as well. So certainly um, this is not the typical pattern of UIP. And here is the lung biopsy, which is rather long, but there is subpleural fibrosis about terminal airways. Some of the airways have some remodeling. There's some peribronchiolar metaplasia, but that doesn't help to separate out chronic HP from other fibrosing lung disorders, but then we see a description of some cells, lymphocytes, plasma cells, loose granulomas. And here is a consultation with a pulmonary pathologist elsewhere who pretty much agrees with the description. And if you look at the some of the words up here, particularly here, that they are definitely leading towards chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, he says, overwhelmingly so. So I think there's a nice correlation between the description there and the imaging findings. Yeah, this is a, a, a more straightforward case. We had two cases this past uh, Monday on our uh, RADPATH conference 
that had what we would call probable UIP patterns on CT. It was basal predominant subpleural reticulation, some traction bronchiectasis, no honeycombing, no mosaic attenuation or air trapping. But the surgical biopsies on both of them showed similar features as what you just showed. It showed, um, you know, it showed some fibrosis, but there was more around airways. Uh, there was peribronchiolar metaplasia, which is less common with UIP, uh, run-of-the-mill UIP, um, more lymphocytes than usual, and then um, and the interstitial giant cells, which, you know, if you see enough of them, you really start having to think about um, HP as well. And it's interesting because, you know, both of these were older patients, older males. So you know, thinking of the new guidelines, many of them might not get biopsies, but what prompted them is they had lymphocytosis on their BALs, which can be useful, and then did have exposure histories as well. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's, I think HP is one of the most challenging diagnoses to make because, and like you showed and have sh shown before, the, um, the imaging overlaps with that of UIP, IPF, and even the pathology camp. Yep, exactly. I think this patient shows the same kind of thing, so I'll scroll through the weather quickly. Um, there's clearly a lot of pulmonary fibrosis, but first off, it is not basal predominant disease. And if we actually started in the lung bases, there's a real relative paucity of findings of fibrosis in the subpleural regions of the lower lung zones, as in foci of traction bronchiolectasis, which are not present in the and now honeycombing. And then as we go and look through the rest of the lungs, we see multiple foci of traction bronchiectasis away from pleural surfaces. Now I'll scroll up, so for example here, but in other places like that, there's a nice example there. If we go to that particular area on the coronal, or just looking at the coronal series alone, again, this is very similar to the previous one I showed you, where the foci of traction bronchiectasis are rather conspicuous away from pleural surfaces. And there is a conspicuous absence of subpleural traction bronchiolectasis and certainly no honeycombing. So that too, in my view, is much more suggestive of a non-UIP. And here are kind of excerpts of an open lung biopsy in this patient. And the excerpt here seems to be um, quoting another consultation with a pulmonary pathologist. But if you look at what we see here, while there are findings described as early honeycomb change, there are areas of fibroblastic proliferation which one can see, but then patchy mononuclear inflammatory infiltrate, some giant cells, as Jeff said, prominent peribronchiolar metaplasia in this person. So I think this person is leaning again towards chronic HP by virtue of the multinucleated giant cells and the mild lymphoid hyperplasia, as you can see there. But I think um, I would agree with that. I would have no trouble with that kind of pathology result and describing it as concordant with what we see here, more of a non-UIP pattern. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very, very similar. Oh, how are we, we? Yeah, go ahead. So we published a paper here looking at all of our possible UIP patterns and inconsistent with UIP pattern studies. Brownell was the pulmonologist that published it. And we saw, you know, with, with patients like this, you know, when you don't have a definite UIP pattern that because we have such a high prevalence of, of HP in our population that adding demographics like men over 65 with severe like traction bronchiectasis rather than just mild really increased the pretest probability that it was UIP rather than something like HP. So like someone, when we see cases like this, I agree, because one of the other things in this case you see, there's a lot of perilobular, it's, it's more than just reticulation, there's like perilobular fibrosis, almost like you see sometimes with organizing pneumonia. See how like some of those lobules, Here. yeah. And we, and, and Brad Elliker has been looking at all of these and hasn't published it yet, but we seem to see that a lot more often with HP as well. But, yeah, I, I agree with everything else that you and Jeff said. Yeah. 
Here's the third case. This one I came across quite recently. And for this patient, I don't have an open lung biopsy. But I'll show you quickly what her lungs looked like in 2015, at which time, again, there's definitely a fibrosing interstitial lung disorder, but very hard to characterize. But certainly none of the typical features one would like to see with, say, UIP at that time. But let's go forward now to the recent one when the disease is more extensive. I'm going to skip 2017 and go to find my thin cuts here. There we go. And we'll see that the interstitial lung disease, the fibrosis, is increased. But again, notice there a foci of traction bronchiectasis, maybe that pattern that that Travis just described in relation to the pulmonary lobules in the periphery of the lung, with more traction bronchiectasis. And then when we get down here, we see more of the same, more of the same, but quite a few lobules here that are actually seemingly spared. But although there's a lot of basal lung disease, we don't have the subpleural bronchiolectasis or honeycombing pattern. And then perhaps not surprisingly, when one looks at couple of expiration images, they are lobules of air trapping in the lower lung zones. So this in the context of our multidisciplinary conference this past week, I suggested very strongly that this is consistent with chronic HP, not UIP. Yeah, agreed. Question for you guys, the 2011 ATS guidelines explicitly said that air trapping was three or more lobes and now with the new Fleischner and ATS, it's more it's moved more, I forget the exact wording, but it's just like significant mosaic attenuation or air trapping, which is kind of a vague term. What do you how do you approach that at your institutions now? I look at sort of the distribution of the air trapping um, because you'll see, I mean, we see basal, you want to call it air trapping or heterogeneity of gas emptying in the lower lobes all the time. So I don't get too excited about that, or if it's just one lobule. But if I have non-dependent sort of patchy lobules of air trapping, especially sort of mid and upper zone, then I start getting a little suspicious. Although in my experience, the as the fibrosis gets worse with HP, the degree of air trapping seems to diminish. And so I don't put a lot of, but like, look at this case here in Howard's case, look in the coronal, you see how much mosaic attenuation there is, particularly lobule, low attenuation lobules in the upper zones, and they're very discrete. I would have no trouble with that one. But if there's just one or two, I would. I, it, I think it depends more on the distribution than that presence. You said the upper or the lower on this case? Well, he, and this one, I mean, it's kind of everywhere, but that upper left upper lobe has some pretty, right, even that image has well, dark lobules. I mean, there's some in the lower lobes too, but yeah. typically you don't see physiologic heterogeneity in the upper lobes nearly as much. Yeah, I just find the degree of mosaicism actually in the more whatever subacute inflammatory cases to be more in the lower lobes actually. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't, in terms of what constitutes air trapping, I don't know. And how much is normal, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah. 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 All right, those are my cases, Jeff. All right, thank you, Howard. Who'd like to go next? I can go. All right, Seth. One second, let me just pull these. One second. Ah, here. Share. Uh, patient ID. All right. Uh, this is <clears throat> a nice case of, we can see all these nice myocardial, epicardial, um, Unfortunately, it's a non-contrast study, but these fatty masses and uh, whenever you see multiple fatty masses like this in the heart, especially in a younger patient, I think um, right away you kind of get one diagnosis screaming at you, but then you start seeing that this patient also has these fatty masses in the liver. Um, the, there's one in the left kidney right there, the right kidney is gone. And then of course, if you look at the lungs, although it's not the most raging case, um, you can see that there's a bunch of 
scattered cysts, so better seen on MINIPS. So this is a nice case of um, uh, lymphangiomyoma, TS basically, with associated lymphangiomyomatosis, and then these fatty cardiac masses, which are um, quite common. I think Mass General took their cohort of patients many years ago and looked at it and found that um, a large percentage of them had these uh, cardiac masses. And I'm not, to tell you the truth, pathologically, I'm still a little confused about what they represent pathologically, um, if they represent, because um, I, I don't, from my understanding, they're not angiomyolipomas, they're just lipomas in the heart, but that's kind of interesting since a lot of people now think this is a, TS is actually a low-grade malignancy. I don't know, there's a, have you guys heard that theory that, yes, yes. like, yeah, that on pathology. Yeah. Um, LAM is considered a malignant now, or at least a neoplasm. Yeah. yeah. And that TS as well, and that these are all, so um, just a nice case. But I'm not, again, I don't know if anyone knows, Travis, if you know what pathologically these fatty cardiac lesions represent. I haven't been able nope. to find a good. I, I've never found a, a good answer. No, either have I. I've looked on and the literature and can't find anything. Another question that this brings up, and I think I brought this up a few years ago, was a it was a patient with LAM, or what they thought had LAM in our ILD, except there were fatty myocardial masses like this, and they hadn't done TS gene testing yet. But have has anyone ever seen these in just LAM, the, the intramyocardial fatty foci? Because I can't find the answer to this in the literature either. You know, no. whether they're exclusively seen as TS or if they're also seen in LAM. I've never yeah. seen, I, I think when you meant, we mentioned that a few years ago, you brought it up and ever since then I've looked at my LAM cases and all subsequent ones and have yet to find, except the one that had TS in it, I think I showed that had a little fatty spot. I've yet to see a sporadic LAM with, with fat in the heart. Yeah. We, same, same here, but I, I, yeah, I haven't seen one, but doesn't mean they don't exist. I don't have a lot of cases of this, but, uh, uh, the next case is, what is the next case? Oh, this is just a weird case. So this guy presented in our, we have a lot of weird CTEF. I have to send the case. Travis, you missed my case last week of a primary uh, segmental osteosarcoma of the right lower lobe, which was surprising. Uh, this one is almost as weird. Um, so this guy presented for... Um, surgery for CTEF. Now, uh, somehow, you can see he's got a quite a large right heart, flattening of the septum, um, a lot of what looks like simple pulmonary embolism. And for some reason, this was read out in the right heart, Let's see if I can get this, as thrombus. Um, I'd be a little hesitant to call that thrombus for various reasons. One, it's invading through the Thebesian valve into the coronary sinus and into the coronary sinus and surrounding it and enveloping it and extending along the cardiac veins, that itself would be a little bit strange for a, uh, um, a simple thrombus. And then, you know, and anyways, so they take him to surgery under the, a lot of these cases, they don't review them with us. They just kind of take him to surgery, which is slowly starting to change. And the surgeons right away can know when these don't when they start trying to pull these things out and do it they can tell right away that it's between tumor and thrombus which is interesting they say the thrombus is kind of like um thrombus is thrombus it's hard stuck on material whereas tumor is like jelly it's like um jelly or, or jello it's like trying to pick it up and it just doesn't pull out it just stays there anyways this guy passed away um they weren't able to remove they removed some of it but he passed away from complications of surgery underwent an autopsy, and this was um, a, a, you know, angiosarcoma's kind of less aggressive uh, stepbrother, the uh, epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. So this was a primary cardiac epithelioid hemangioendothelioma uh, really. with, uh, yeah, with massive shedding, massive embolus. Um, and they thought the surgeon went in. He said he said the coronary sinus was completely invaded by tumors, enveloped. It was surrounding. We know epithelial hemangioendothelioma. There's supposedly the spectrum of vascular tumors on this hemangioma, epithelial hemangioendothelioma, and then um, angiosarcoma spectrum. You know, I, I'm not sure pathologically 
what differentiates one from the other, or mitoses or whatever. I, I don't know. But um, they came back and said, absolutely, this is 100% an epithelial hemangioma and epithelioma. So Jeez. we're going to write we're going to write this one up because it's never been described in the heart. Um, and there was no other disease elsewhere, uh, just in the heart and the pulmonary arteries. So that was fascinating. Uh, what was this case? Oh, yeah. These, <laughs> it's sad that these have become commonplace now. Um, this is my, uh, like I say, my third cardiac sarcoma or pulmonary sarcoma this month. Um, so these always get called PEs, and I'm writing a paper now. We now have 50 of these from here and another, uh, or 40 from here and another 25 from the ARP. And I would say the ones that are central or even in the low bar, every single one, I'm going to call it the sausage sign, unless any of you guys have a better idea. They all have this sausage-like appearance. They they don't, these always get a call, called a QPEs. And... Um, you know, in every case of a QPE, I've seen, A, I haven't seen one go into the main PA yet. I have some chronic PEs that go into the main, but no QPEs that go in the main. But none of them, acute or chronic PEs, have this very sausage-like appearance. Um, and I would say of the 50 or so sarcomas I've looked at, 85% uh, of them have this disappearance. So I think it's a nice way to differentiate. Um, let me show you real quick. The path what this came out. Nope, that's the sarcoma Andrew Sar osteosarcoma here. So here is the path here came comes out. Um, and most so when you see this stuff, it's actually clean intima. They pull off the intima, but most of this stuff is <laughs> clearly tumor. And what's fascinating is they say what's unfortunate about these cases is that even when they pull off this stuff and they send the cleaner looking intima to pathology that every single case that they've done here, which is about 80 cases, um, that there's almost always invasion and in tumor lining the intima, even in the uninvolved areas on the other uh, contralateral side. So, uh, and then you could just look at this, just tumor busting out here. So um, yeah, a nice case of a, oh, and here's, oh, sorry. So the other reason I wanna show, let me show if I can do this real quick, and get finished with these cases so someone else can talk. See if I can load these up side by side. Um, so this was called a QPE. Um, and these things grow, as we know, they're sarcomas. These things grow so fast. So here's this study, right? Here it is here. And this is literally four weeks later. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's tumor. This is not thrombus. This is, this is tumor. I mean, there's mixed thrombus. But these things grow so f f fast. Um, and, you know, the only chance of survival is catching it early, but they're just always called PEs. Every of the 40 cases we have, 30 have reports and all 30 of them were called a QPE. Uh, it's really, it's really unfortunate. I mean, it's a bad disease to start. And then lastly, just for, because it's a cool case, I'll show you our interesting dolphin anatomy. So we have a guy here now who does it consults for SeaWorld. And this is a... Um, <laughs> sick dolphin who has aspergillus and you can see some little patchy stuff down here and if you ever wanted to know what dolphin anatomy looked like on a ct uh this is dolphin anatomy they have a pig bronchus but they're that kind of maybe pigs are from related to dolphins uh i know pigs are related to yeah why did the pigs get it named after them i know and then here oh sorry and we also got the uh albert did a very nice so we get the head we colored it blue and you can see his little eyes and his little rostrum. And it's kind of just a cool dolphin CT. So I'll send that along. You can play That's with it. Awesome. <laughs> so one other question with your with your intimal sarcoma cases, in addition to the sausage sign, like how many of those patients come in with any sort of right heart strain? Because I always, I mean, the all of, all of the cases I've seen, you know, of, of intimal sarcoma, it's usually pretty well compensated. And you'd think if it's a QPE, they should be, you know, dying of right heart failure. Um, we have cases of, so, you know, um, that's a good question. I mean, that's another thing we're going to look at. I have to say that uh, the ones that are really, I mean, <laughs> we have some cases where it's like the whole main PA is completely clotted off 
I mean, literally two, I mean, there's a stream of contrast and that's it. And it's still being called a QPE, non-resolving a QPE. And those patients have severe right heart strain, but you're right. I have to say that the degree of heart strain I see in these cases um, versus someone with acute or chronic PE to that extent is less. But, um, you know, that, that's, that's a good point. Um, and, and you're right. But I have seen some cases of this with some really massive right heart strain, but it's not, they're usually misdiagnosed for, you know, a, you know, eight months or a year. Right. And I've seen some cases literally go from a little thing sitting in here and then patient has a CT scan every three months and it keeps growing and they keep calling it a QPE and eventually the whole thing shuts off and the patient dies or they send them here finally because they figure it out. Um, but because uh, I, I remember the first case I saw as a resident was the entire main PA replaced with tumor and the patient the RV wasn't even dilated. You know, they clearly were were well compensated. And I always think of that as like you know, a clue that it's obviously not an acute massive embolus. Yeah, but no. Just, I'll be curious to see what your data is, how how yeah, often no, that's, you know, that's, true. that's that you know what, Travis? Thank you for bringing that up because honestly, that's here, here's okay. So can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, there was a patient. And, and the other there, thing so. while I'm thinking about it is bronchial artery hypertrophy. You know what, Travis? You're right. Look at this, right? Yeah. I mean, look at this thing. And you've got big, you've got big bronchial arteries too. Yeah. Which you wouldn't yeah. get with acute PE necessarily. And look, and look and, at the right heart. Yeah. You know what? That's actually. But, but, but also look in that case, Seth, your right ventricle is thickened too, which would be more with a long-standing process. It looks a little thick there. Yeah, yeah diastole it is a little thick. Um, but yeah, no, Trev, that's, you know, the left atrial to right atrial ratio, I guarantee you're 100% right. It's not going to be, the bronchial arteries will be tough because I can tell you the chronic thromboembolic disease population. Which yeah, is but I'm just thinking when these patients come in, like the first time, granted these sarcomas are rare, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, we have some cases that look like, we're wondering like, oh, that looks like CTEF, you know, because you get one that's sitting here. And we have cases that are like, oh, that looks like sarcoma, and they take it out and it's just CTEF. But again, this this ovoid configuration, I haven't seen in a single case other than sarcoma. But you, you know what? I'm definitely going to look at ratio. That's a very good idea. Good. The other thing you should do, you should measure the Hounsfield units because when I look at that, there's no way that's uniform. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it's not. Oh, units. Howard, there are cases I have that are called PE that have like macroscopic major <laughs> vessels running through it. Yep, exactly. Like, you, you know, there. like yeah. literally enhancing there's vessels, it's heterogeneous. We have one case that's like growing out and it's like, in, you know, everywhere and it was still called PE for six months. Um, so there's a lot of missed, and it's so rare. It's, you know, we don't think of it, but there's certain things that definitely would suggest one. And and you're right, but attenuation it, yeah. is definitely it. But it's the same concept with tumor embolism too, when you, because uh, we've all shown and seen cases where you've got tumor embolism that just kept, keeps on getting called PE, they're on anticoagulation, it just keeps on growing. You know, with the rest of their metastatic disease. So I think it's just the concept of thinking of something other than thrombotic yeah. or embolic pulmonary filling defects. Yeah, no, we uh, some of these cases I have to say are, and just so um, if you want to, here, let me just do this, Travis. So you didn't see it last week. I'll just show it real quick just to compare, if I can find it real quick, the case of the uh, pulmonary artery angiosarc or osteosarcoma. Um, I think this is it. So this was a primary osteosarcoma here. Wow. There's central disease and there's no disease anywhere else. So that, that one, that they, they, we did not, no one guessed that one <laughs> prospectively, but, um, yeah. All right. Thanks guys. Sorry for taking so long. Those are great. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Jeff, I'll go ahead and go. I've got a, little free time here in the reading yeah. room. Take advantage. Okay. We'll start with a couple of radiograph cases that have angiograph correlates. So this was one from a few weeks ago, and this is a left-sided dialysis catheter that was placed at interventional. And one of my colleagues saw this and thought this looked a little peculiar. You know, the tip is projecting, if you say this is the lateral wall of the superior vena cava, which it probably is, it looks like it's a little lateral. And it doesn't, just doesn't have that normal course in the SVC as you typically see. So she went back and digging through to figure out what was going on. It clearly didn't look like it had perforated anything. Does anybody want to take a guess where it is? 
Uh, let's see. Jeez. Um, because I can make... show you the I can show you the angiogram or the sorry the the you know the fluoroscopic image from when they when they place this. So you can clearly see that from the day before it has changed configuration and it's in something and obviously it, is I'm it in the internal sure. mammary artery? I would have just said azagus, but since you're you're asking, yeah, exactly sure right. Your <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not in the azagus, and you don't even really get a sense from this from this venogram where it is. But um, anyway, to make a long story short, she has right upper lobe PAPVR, so it's in the presumably this is just in that anomalous right superior pulmonary vein that you can see right there. So it's just kind of flipped up into it. Oh, so. I've seen these. We've seen these in the left side. It actually, you can you can see a catheter. I guess this is a catheter that's in it. You can see right there. So we've seen them in left PAPVR before. This is the first time I've seen one in a right upper lobe PAPVR, and there was no associated sinus venosus ASD. So oh, Travis, it looked to me as if on that angiogram that uh, PAPVR might have been blushing. Let's see, on right there, perhaps, or I thought I saw something. It went out lateral. Oh, right in here, right there. Uh huh. Yep, I think you're right. Yep. Yeah, it's. We, we yeah, have I, mean, an, I showed a case of this, I think, years ago. Uh, we had the, the same thing. It came down from the catheter, came down from the left, and then went out into the right lung. Went pretty far out, though, farther out than this one. Yeah. <clears throat> but just thought it was cool because it certainly is a an unusual course there. Yeah. So. That's just a quick one. This one, uh, this is courtesy of my residence at the General. This may be something that Seth saw when he was at Maryland. Uh, but this is a patient who came in, and I'll just show you. He came in with chest pain, and he has hemopericardium. And we've shown numerous cases before of hemopericardium as a, as a result of subtle ventricular rupture or subtle aortic, acute aortic syndrome. There's no intramural hematoma. There's no pulmonary artery shared chief adventitial hematoma. So his aorta looks normal, but what there is, and my residents saw this overnight, is there's this peculiar metal fragment Oops. in in his, or through his RV free wall, you can see the fat there. So of course you would think that this is an IVC filter. Guy's never had an IVC filter. And he also has this right here in his neck and so he is an intravenous drug user and apparently broke off a needle. And I have no idea if this is part of the same needle or if this is a second needle. I was going to make a question. Is it the same needle or two different ones? Cause yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. But, they, um, <laughs> but this, is a, this is confirmed an embolized needle fragment that has perforated the RV and is the cause of the right ventricular or of the hemopericardium. That's awesome. So. Great. And I, I, apparently the IR guys tried to retrieve this uh, percutaneously and were unsuccessful, so they had to take him to the OR and do a do a median sternotomy. But again, you know, hemopericardium in the acute setting, got to find an explanation for it. And then this was, in this case, the explanation. So do they think, I wonder, I, did, even if they did get it, is that safe? I guess it is. <laughs> Let's say they uh, were able to pull that thing out. I mean, I guess the, right. tamp the tamponade would prevent the uh, blood from flowing out i don't know right that's a good question is there is there something else that you're going to need to to a, a hole you're going to need to seal up or is it going to seal itself yeah. yeah i don't know but he did end up with a median sternotomy this one here's a, a good eye test and i will put the radiographs up side by side so this is a woman who is around 28 to 30 weeks pregnant and you'll see this is the more recent one on this side she comes in with hemoptysis and i'll let you look at that i can show you the lateral too once people have had a chance to there's um abnormality in the medial segment of right middle lobe um yep. most likely maybe there's some tubular opacities associated with it that are not just vessels maybe in addition to vessels and then yeah, and that's that's exactly yeah, that's what it is. Where the pathology is though. Yeah. Yeah, that's where the pathology is. And um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Without the comparison, you look at the you could look at the lateral and say, well, she's got a little bit of pectus, but you're right. I think Howard, one of the big clues, and I'll stop syncing this, is the fact that not only do you have arteries and well vessels here, it looks like you've got 
paired branching structures, which you will see do represent plugged bronchi as well. So she came in with hemoptysis, and this is the CT. And you'll see that there is an enhancing endobronchial lesion here. And it, what's kind of interesting about this one is that it's expansile, no surprise, but it's very elongated. This is all tumor going into the posterior basal segment. And then she's got all this mucus plugging. Her right middle lobe was collapsed, which was part of that loss of the right heart border. But it's interestingly that it's just probably blood in her right middle lobe because the right middle lobe bronchus itself wasn't obstructed by this mass. Mm. So she was she was pregnant at the uh, she is pregnant at the time, and so she was in the hospital for a while. And you can see she's this is probably all just little foci of hemorrhage and post obstructive, whatever, because she came in with hemoptysis. But I show this because it's kind of cool that they went in. I mean, this is number one, two, and three going to be a carcinoid tumor, given that it's hypervascular. But I show this because it's kind of cool. They did a bronchial artery embolization before you know, to temporize her hemoptysis, and then before she went to surgery because they weren't going to weren't, weren't sure if they were going to wait until after the baby was delivered to go in and resect this or not. But they did end up going in and doing a right lower lobectomy, and this was in fact a, a typical carcinoid tumor. All of her nodes were negative, and it was very soft, it pulled right, it came out right with the right lower lobe and it was kind of just growing elongated into that right lower lobe like I showed on the CT. So, but nice angiographic correlate again, talking about bronchial arteries. And you can see that big bronchial artery right here and going right into this thing. So, but a subtle radiograph and I think that, yeah, Howard, all the findings you pointed out are very, you know, very astute in that. And then I'll show this really quick, just along the theme of, of PE and not PE. And we've shown this before, uh, but this is a patient who has congenital heart disease and has been repaired. And of course, the type of repair in this case contributes to the finding that we see. So whenever you have patients, this was done at an outside hospital and they transferred here for what they thought was possible pulmonary embolism on the right. At least they said on the left it was non-diagnostic, but of course you can see this patient has a bidirectional glen, so superior vena cava to pulmonary artery, and then a fontan, so you have this communication to the pulmonary arteries. And so in these patients, we don't, we usually don't mess around with like lower and upper extremity injection. We just do delayed imaging, but this is all just smoke as you can see here in the pulmonary artery, or conceivably they could have a PE and it's just non-diagnostic. So we put it to rest by repeating here with a delay, and you'll just see that on the delay, you, know, you still got perfectly adequate contrast opacification, and so there's no PE. And there was that nice article in Radiographics a couple of years ago dealing with timing for cases like this. Wait, 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 wait. When did yeah. you? Okay. That is the nicest bolus I've ever seen on a Fontan. When did this? you? For yes. When did you time that? Because we have. We do these so often, and we've tried every protocol, and we I just, never get them as nice. 75 seconds? Dude, we do 70. What do you inject at? We do, I, we do, I mean, we do a lot of contrast. So I would guess there's probably 125 or 150 cc's, but at we what, do it at four at cc's. At what at, rate? Usually four, or four or five. Dude, so. man, I don't know. <laughs> it's so frustrating. Like, I had yeah. a case the other day, same exact freaking thing. Um, yeah, just looks like crap. I mean, time at 70, 60 seconds, 70 seconds, 80 seconds, yeah. 90 seconds, 120 cc's, 150 cc's. I've never seen a case look as homogeneous as the, uh, well, I'll, I'll forward your compliments onto Karen too. She'll be happy to hear it. Yeah. yeah. Tell her to send me her exact protocol because I'm, okay. and, and I'll look and see, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing this was done at 120 KV, but it might've been at a hundred. I'll let you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, I mean, we don't have a, I mean, I was just on the phone with a technologist and I said, just do a 75 second delay. Yeah. I mean, okay. So, but this was our arterial, which looks the same as the outside one. But again, it was whenever you know that, you know, and Seth, you know this, but just for everyone else out there, you know, who might be tuning in. Yeah. Always think about doing delays when you know a patient has congenital heart disease that's been repaired. So. Yeah, and if they don't have a pacer or defibrillator or one that's MR compatible, we do a MR angio on these, and it also takes care of the issues. Yeah. Yeah, but you guys also have an amazing support staff for your MR stuff. So that is true. Oh, do, do right. you struggle? With, do you struggle with that at UCSF? 
Yeah, we don't even mess around with these in the in the acute setting. Oh, you should. Uh, so. I, I thought it was just here. Maybe it's a whole UC system, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't say that. The, well, the, the unions are listening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it for me, Jack. All right, thanks, Travis. David, you got anything? I've got a couple. All right. <clears throat> So here's a woman with a um, a mass. She uh, came into an outside hospital because she was having some difficulty breathing. You can see that this big mass is uh, displacing her trachea to the left. And on CT, um, it's having quite an effect on the uh, on the airway. Here's the carina being flattened here and narrowed. So she's supposed to breathe through these narrowed tubes here. Here's our lesion with... Um, low attenuation, not necrotic looking stuff and some scattered calcifications. Kind of looks like a giant fibrous tumor of the <clears throat> of the pleura, except it's a funny location where it probably arises medially. If it's pleural, it's arising medially along the mediastinum, or maybe it's really coming from the mediastinum itself. So it's not clear what this is. She uh, eventually she developed more consolidation in the lung bases here. Probably she was having um, some perhaps some obstruction on the right here, or maybe some aspiration going on. <clears throat> so uh, big mass, it was needle biopsy. This this came in when all the surgeons were away last week at a meeting, <clears throat> and there was a lot of hesitation about going ahead and trying to remove this. They didn't think they could do it by vats. <clears throat> I suggested high forceps, um, you know, but I didn't think this was gonna be a spontaneous, spontaneous delivery. So they haven't operated on it yet, but they did biopsy it, and it turns out to be a uh, a schwannoma. So um, necrotic elements here and calcifications. This was our fellow's first diagnosis here. This looked like a nerve sheath tumor. Perhaps it's arising from the vagus nerve. There were subsequent MR studies to see if there was any connection to the spine, and there was not. And the MR studies to our neuroradiologist does not disclose the origin of this tumor. That will probably emerge when it eventually is removed. So a very large schwannoma. So David, and I don't know if you have this information, but in retrospect, had her symptoms been more prolonged because these usually go pretty slowly. Yes, uh, and you know, the, the, the hugeness of it is good for that slow growth. And that's, that's true of the fibrous tumors of the pleura too, they often, you know, they grow very slowly and therefore the person accommodates them. <clears throat> she, this woman does not seek medical care very often, but there was some something in her record about having seen something years ago. And we don't have any film record of that, but uh, maybe there was a precursor lesion to this uh, that was just ignored uh, by her and not followed up uh, from something years ago. <clears throat> okay, and then here's another person with a central um, convexity here and here's what it looks like on um, CT this is all outside imaging here it has fairly low attenuation I got I measured it earlier and I got minus seven Hounsfield units so right around water attenuation for this thing they considered because of its proximity to the esophagus the working diagnosis was esophageal cyst you know I've not seen very many of those those are pretty rare I thought you know, this would, would be good for a bronchogenic cyst um, being high up like this. They usually have higher attenuation than water because they've got mucus in them. So more like often like 20 Hounsfield units or so. And this lesion was uh, was resected um, about two weeks ago and the diagnosis came back bronchogenic cyst. So, um, you know, low attenuation, lower attenuation than most bronchogenic cysts, a little, you know, it's, does it's pretty close to the subcarinum here, so that's a good location for bronchogenic cyst. And I don't know what what uh, set them off to considering an esophageal cyst as the first diagnosis. And then uh, Stalker wanted me to show you guys this case. Um, here's a person who had a um, fairly normal best radiograph, except for some aortic calcification. Is an older man. Um, back in November. And around that time, he had an abdominal CT scan, which um, didn't show much in the chest, but showed impressive um,
distension of the gallbladder. The tissue around the gallbladder looks pretty normal. Though. I'm not really seeing any fat stranding that impresses me or with contrast here, wall thickening. But um, symptoms progressed and this, this fellow was then readmitted um, in, uh, this month. I hope I'm not showing any names here. Um, but he's now got an impressive pleural effusion on the right. And uh, as we get down into the abdomen, maybe I can make this a little uh, less garish. Get down into the abdomen, uh, he's got all of this uh, fat stranding and smudginess here where the gallbladder was, and the gallbladder does not look to be intact. Here's a coronal projection showing pleural effusion. And then this upper abdominal gas collection near the liver, which is all contiguous with the bed of the gallbladder and the gallbladder wall is disrupted. <clears throat> and they grew um, E. coli out of the pleural effusion. I don't know whether they saw bile in the pleural effusion, but he has, the diagnosis is that he has a fistula, fistulous connection between his gallbladder fossa. There'd been no surgery and his pleural space. So I'm gonna check the chemistry of the fluid. I haven't had a chance to do that yet to see whether there was any hint that this uh, contained bile, but it did contain E. coli. And so, and the doctor noted that the colon was very near this lesion too, but subsequent studies suggest the colon itself was uninvolved, even though it was nearby. This is probably all fistulized from, from the, um, the uh, disrupted gallbladder. And David, do you think the lung is involved too? I missed part of it because because we've checked sputum bile that's been positive in some of these bronchobiliary fistulae. Right. That's another place they can check. Yeah, it's it's hard it's hard to know. I mean, the the lung is pretty collapsed here. I'm not sure that there's a flu fluid collection with it. There is a pleural drain in place. At this point, there was there had been no um, abdominal drainage. So this. This gas collection right here, I, think, I think, is spontaneous and not the result of any uh, medical intervention down there. I don't know about the lung. I'll try to get more history. When I looked at the interim um, history from <clears throat> the 29th, they didn't say anything about bile in the, in the sputum, and I don't think they said anything about bile in the pleural fluid collection either. So what do you call these, biliopleural fistulas or... Um, coli pleural fistulas or something like that. Um, it's the first one I've seen. Do you have a name for it, Travis? I've, we call them bronchobiliary if they go into the airways, which I've, yeah. I think I've shown at least one of those. I don't, I don't know if it's just yeah, pleurobiliary, I don't know. See, I, I, don't th I doubt that he had that because uh, before this CT scan here, he had chest radiographs that just showed pleural effusion they did not show any gas collection in the pleural space. And I think if there had been a communication back to the bronchus, we would have had air uh, with the pleural fluid. It wouldn't have been just liquid. Okay, those are the... Those well, are the I'd call it badness. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think somebody should have intervened back when that gallbladder was so descended. We should have had some follow-up, but there was... There was about six weeks, I think, of his not being uh, under medical care, at least at our institution. All right. So let's take a look at this case. Let's see. So um, this is a case. So this is another case that we had. Um, we've had two combined ascending and descending aortic injuries in the past recent while. And um, these are two radiographs of the same patient. The one on your left is not too long after the stent graft was placed. And then the patient was declining several days later. And this is the subsequent radiograph. So anybody see the major change? Yeah, there's there is apparently air in the stent. Exactly. Yeah, this was uh, there is gas or air or something in where the stent was. So I will show you the original uh, CT scan. So um, I can't remember. This is uh, so this is the original injury here, and we can see there's a lot of mediastinal hematoma. There is a bleeding um, 
proximal descending aortic injury. And then we've got a hemopericardium as well. And then we have an ascending injury, which you know many of these are not survivable. We have a chest drain here that looks maybe malpositioned, but we won't get into all that. So really bad. And patient was not doing well. So they opted to stent this injury first because it was actively bleeding and to, they were worried about uh, anticoagulation and all that with the ascending. Um, and then as the patient declined exactly, we see, oh, let's see, there's the, um, where's the radiograph? Let's get the right one here. There we go. Uh, we start seeing this gas in here and uh, I'll show you the CT because it's quite impressive. And um, this patient, as you can imagine, did not do very well from this, but there is now gas in the aortic lumen. There's a lot of sub-Q gas. And the question is, and then you can see this, this flap here, is where did this come from? And if we go down the abdomen, you'll see there's pronounced portal venous gas, um, and there's gas everywhere, and gas in the wall, the bowel. Um, so it's unclear what happened if there was a perf bowel or something, but you know, you'd expect that to drain into the portal system. How did it get into the systemic arterial system? Maybe there's a shunt somewhere or not. But this resulted in massive air embolism, which was rapidly fatal. Um, still unclear what happened. But you know, I've only seen one other case where I've seen air in the aorta, and this is definitely one of them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Is it just retrograde propagation through the mesenteric arteries back up into the aorta from wow. mesenteric ischemia? I have no idea, or if there was a shunt, you know, they... There, there was a ton of air, and it looked like in the celiac or the SMA as you went by there. I mean, it's right. just completely filled with air. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, right there. I guess it's possible. Um, you know, it's unclear where it came from. Wow. There's just so much air. I don't have a head CT, but um, I don't think the patient survived very long to do that. You can see she had massive injuries. There's pelvic fractures and a bunch of intra-abdominal injuries, so... But it looks like very unhappy bowel and uh, very unhappy everything. It, it would seem like it would have to go upstream in the right. aorta if there's nothing in the if there's no shunt and nothing in the pulmonary. Right. There is a little bit of gas here in the left atrium. So maybe Strange. it's coming through. A, I don't know where it's coming from, to be honest. Yeah, this was just crazy, just bad. All right. What has been described before are stent to esophageal fistula. Mm -hmm. That sometimes complicate stent yeah. placement, but we didn't see that. All right, so what? this is just a follow-up of a case I showed you guys a while ago, but I came across this the other day. So remember I showed that case of pancreatitis, sepsis, and myocardial calcification. Well, patient got another CT for whatever reason, and just showing, I wanted to show this, I'll go the, back to the earlier one, uh, progressive calcification. It's still happening even now. So that was the that was starting to calcify, um, and that was a couple about a month ago and now you can see it's even more it's getting denser it almost looks like it's ossifying um but just progressive ongoing even though you know still has the pleural effusions and still has a really angry looking abdomen um so this injury you know can still progress and who knows how long this will continue to evolve i don't think we get this many serial images in these patients but i thought i'd show that real quickly what's yeah. always amazing is what's that the their function is normal yeah yeah <laughs> They're freaking normal. It's like, uh, did this patient have diffuse alveolar damage or some really bad lung injury? No, no, they had acute kidney failure related kidney failure. to um, okay. pancreatitis and sepsis. Oh, sepsis. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, say which has been described. Sepsis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, and before we go, I want to show this case. Um, so, this is a patient um, who had a upper lobec, a right upper lobectomy for a lung cancer. And developed a complication post-operatively. So I'm gonna actually show it in backwards order because I think it's uh, more important. And this is one of these ones that you know, patient was referred from elsewhere for their surgery. And so uh, over, I'll, just, I'll show a radiograph. So this was shortly post-op and we can see there's post-operative pneumothorax and there's this area of consolidation at the right lung apex that developed and sort of hung out. So that this was post-op and you can see on subsequent radiographs, it kind of just stays there. And we'll see this with lung that doesn't reinflate, but it's awfully sharply demarcated. So at this point, you have to wonder what's going on. Is there is there bleeding or something going on? So uh, they ordered a CT, um, which we, we did here. And you can see there's this area in the right upper lobe that corresponds to that. You notice it's not perfusing very well. 
Uh, there's the staple line. We see pulmonary arteries coming up and around it, passing through it, but we don't see any venous drainage. Mm -hmm. And there's the bronchial stump and the pulmonary arterial stump is here. So it doesn't look like there's any problems with these resection margins. And then you can see middle lobe bronchus comes up in here. So this is clearly a segment of the middle lobe. And I'll switch over to the lung windows. And you can see this looks all the world like a venous infarct. And that's what it presumably is. Um, and what's interesting is the preoperative anatomy. And we have an outside non-contrast chest CT, but I think it shows the, I think I, it shows the abnormality. So what was challenging in this patient, there's the cancer right there, was the fact that the, di the distinction between the middle lobe and the upper lobe is not real clear. There's only a little remnant of a fissure right there. So, and I've always wondered about this, when you have sort of a, high, a combined middle upper lobe for a surgical, for a cancer resection, how do you manage it? And so the surgeon in this case had to sort of, they saw that little bit of fissure and then had to sort of dissect towards the hilum to get um, you know, a complete resection. But you know, I always wonder if should these be managed as middle lobe or you know, just take both of them or, or not. Um, but what, what's interesting is, is the, and the bronchial anatomy is normal. We can see there's the middle, medial and lateral segment. There's a standard looking upper lobe. But the, the, the real interesting part is the, is the vascular anatomy. And so you can see uh, there's uh, this vein here that drains this portion of the middle lobe actually um, comes, if I can get, let me get right windows here, uh, uh, comes into the superior pulmonary vein. And then there was a second branch. So there's the superior pulmonary vein. And then there's another middle lobe branch right there that goes to this portion of the middle lobe. So what happened is when the surgeon took the upper lobe and stapled across, created a, you know, what, they call, what they call neo fissures, which really aren't, um, they inadvertently took this accessory branch to the, when they took the superior pulmonary vein, took this venous branch that happens to drain a portion of the middle lobe, just a little bit of a variant there. And it's, you can imagine in the OR, you can't see this because you don't have a fissure where you can see along there. And it's just an anomalous anatomy. And, you know, honestly, I don't pay that much attention to branch veins um, and just routine scans. Um, and I don't, you know, the outside radiologist sure didn't comment on it. And, but I think it's important for these surgical cases to uh, really pay attention and maybe address this these fissures because we know they're often incomplete, but this is almost non-existent here. And I think that's what led to this complication of um, of a venous infarct is this sort of accessory branch that came off the superior vein that drained the middle lobe veins where there was a separate middle lobe vein at the hilum, which was mistaken for draining the entire middle lobe. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. So okay. at this point... He, they're not going back in there and they're going to hope this sort of resolves on its own because yeah. uh, they don't really want to mess around with it. And I suppose that, I suppose that's what's going to happen. But um, so far there's been no further complication. <clears throat> All right. So, well, go ahead. Yeah. The middle lobe is really a problem. And you know, when you do an upper lobectomy, the middle lobe is torqued way around and pulled upward to get into that space to uh, replace the volume lost by the upper lobectomy. And that puts a lot of uh, that puts a lot of tension on the um, on the bronchus and can compress the bronchus. So the the middle lobe is a, a fairly puny lobe, and you're stretching it like this. The vessels are small, and the bronchi are small, and they're easily compromised when they have to rearrange themselves this dramatically after a right upper lobectomy. Yeah. But this so, one was interesting because this one the one only one segment was infarcted, and it's because its vein yeah. was different. But that's why you see it immediately postoperatively on the radiographs of that well demarcated area of, of consolidated lung right along that. And it's just accentuated by the pneumothorax. Got it. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Great cases. And I will talk to you next week. Keep warm. Yep. I'm trying. Keep warm. All right. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.